I think that a state of the world's um, biodiversity would be extremely important, among other reasons, because of this link between biodiversity and livelihoods. Um, and I'd like to go a little bit more deeply into this issue of biodiversity livelihoods and what are some of the policy challenges to actually getting these good case studies spread out more in the world. Um, I'll be speaking to you <clears throat> about some, some interesting experiences we've had in my country, in Iran. <clears throat> Since 2006, we've been, um, we've been implementing a, a program on participatory plant breeding. And I'll be speaking about where we started, where that has taken us in terms of enhancing biodiversity in the field, and also some of the policy questions that that raises. First of all, just to say that, um, uh, just to remind us that a livelihood is, is defined to be sustainable when it can cope with and recover from stresses, shocks, and maintain or enhance its capabilities and assets, both now and in the future, while not undermining its ecological base. I start with this because it takes us to the next point, which is, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> I'm losing my voice, which is, of course, climate change, which has already been mentioned several times. The, the shocks that are coming into these small farms are much more apparent now, and the need for resilience is even much more. In our last report of the high-level panel of experts, we highlighted the fact that biodiversity and genetic resources play a very, very important role in increasing the resilience of these small, these small farms to these types of shocks. What have we been doing um, in Iran and in many other countries in the world? With the help of ICARDA, we have set up a program on participatory plant breeding. Um, so this is where, as you see on the left, you have a, a typical research station where normally breeding is done. And instead, we say, no, the, breeding has the, the, the trials have to take place in farmers' fields because that's where you get this very complex interaction between all of the different factors of biodiversity in the context of that particular farmer, his or her ecological but also social, also economic context, and the decisions should be made by the farmers themselves. And this is what participatory plant breeding is about. Um, we started six year, uh, in 2006, so seven years ago now, with 70 different lines of barley, and we now we've arrived at four lines which have been chosen, so this is uh, in, in five villages, and this is a clear example of how you can, how participatory plant breeding really gets you very quickly into increasing biodiversity in the field. However, I just, sorry, it's a PDF. Um, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Um, first, let me just say that participatory plant breeding, why is it important, or what are the challenges that, that conventional plant breeding has faced? Often the research agenda is decided by scientists without consultation with users. This is one of the reasons why, why, um, why there's this big sort of gap between science and farmers. Agricultural research seldom uses an integrated approach, and I think this is something that, that I would hope that the state of the world's biodiversity takes on board more fully. We have to get out of these silos of, for example, plant genetic resources, and then we have another ex expert on aquatic genetic resources and another expert on forest genetic resources. We have to have an integrated approach, and that means new ways of doing research, most essentially doing it in the field and invo involving the actual stakeholders. And lastly, as we all know, a large number of technologies generated by agricultural research are not used by farmers. Um, so um, years and years of research in, a, in, a, in, in the station, and you give it to the farmer, and the farmer doesn't have the resources that were used on the station to produce those particular um, so-called high-yielding varieties. Um, this is the point that I wanted to get at before this. Oh, sorry. I'm oh, very sorry about this. This is a farmer in Kermansha. It's a, it's a Kurdish province in the west of Iran. Um, he's standing in his field, which is a field of 15 different varieties of wheat mixed together. And I think this is the interesting point in the evolution of, of our work in participatory plant breeding. Typically, participatory plant breeding has looked at s starting from single lines and ending up with varieties, and it's always been like this. But as we've been working with researchers and also in contact with different farmers from around the world, we've been hearing more and more that mixtures are what brings resilience into the field. 
Um, and so what we've been doing is, instead of um, ending up as the final product uh, with one particular line, the farmers are testing 70 or 100 different lines, choosing the best ones, but not uh, a too narrow selection, and then they mix them all together. So this is an example. And they find that these mixtures are what brings resilience in the face of climate change and other things. So it's, it's, we're, we're go, we're, we took a few, a few years ago one important step forward. That, well, of course, the first step was to go into the field and to do the research in the field. The second step was to say we need even more biodiversity than we thought. We, we need not just single lines or varieties, not even single land races, but we need mixtures. Um, the, just to give you an example, this is um, Sardari wheat. It's, it's, a, it's a land race that's, that's used on the majority of Iranian um, uh, rain-fed uh, lands for wheat. It's a land race. It's extremely diverse as a land race. As you can see, these are different spikes that are, well, maybe you can't see, but they're quite different, even, even to the naked eye. These are different um, genotypes, well, I don't know, they're, they're, anyway, there are different spikes that were selected. So land races are more diverse than the pure varieties that research stations come up with. However, <clears throat> this particular land race, even though it's extremely popular, is, is very susceptible to yellow rust and to lodging. So even though there is diversity in land, in land races, perhaps we need even more. And this is why um, the researchers that we're working with are going towards these mixtures. And this is a mixture of um, the same 15 lines in the same year where the land race was susceptible to lodging and to rust. And you can see that this, is, this field is doing very well. The next step we took towards even greater biodiversity was what we call evolutionary populations. And this was, um, this was something that was introduced to us by Dr. Salvatore Ceccarelli from, from ICARDA, um, saying maybe we need to look at climate change more seriously and we need to, and there's no way that you can predict exactly what the climate will be in the future, but perhaps we need to start using extremely diverse populations and leave them to evolve in the field. And, and allow the climate and whatever happens, which we can't exactly predict, to slowly change this population over time. Um, and so what you see now is um, what we can also call a mega population. This is 1,600 F2s of barley. It's every single F2 that, that ICARDA produced in a particular year in a mixture in the field, in farmers' fields. We started the first year with four kilos, and we told the farmers, you, you only need a little corner of your field. This is something that you're doing for the future. This is research for the future. You just plant it every year. You harvest it and plant it again and harvest it and plant it again. And that's it. That's all you have to do. That's the simplest way that you can use this. And this will evolve. And this is why we also call them um, gene banks in farmers' fields. It's another way of looking at it. It's an evolving gene bank in farmers' fields. The very interesting thing about this is that some of the farmers who we gave these evolutionary populations to in the first year, they were so happy with the results that they again planted everything that they harvested and it's become their main crop, especially in the rain-fed regions, not so much in the irrigated, but farmers are actually growing this as their main crop, not only as a research issue. This is a, a, another, another way that you can use these populations is that you can deliberately plant them in your most harsh, harshest environments. So this is um, a rain-fed uh, field which is cultivated by pastoralists. The men that you see, uh, well, some of them are scientists, but some of them, the man uh, closest to us here, is, he's actually a pastoralist. Um, he, he uh, like many other Iranian pastoralists, they have in the past been involved with agriculture and increasingly they are uh, um, using crops, especially barley, as animal feed. Um, and so they had this land, um, normally they would irrigate it, but we said to them, we have this strange thing called an evolutionary population, we give it to you, plant it in your field with extremely low rainfall. You can see this is very near the Persian Gulf, it's the south, south, south of Iran. 
uh, in rain-fed conditions, and you see what happens. Just see what happens. So this is the field. When we arrived, they said, it's terrible. We don't want to continue this anymore. You can see it's not a very interesting field. But the point is that when you plant these populations, which are so diverse in harsh environments, you're looking for those one or two um, genotypes which might be doing well in those conditions. You, you give nature so much diversity that you have greater chance that something comes out of it. And this is what we saw. This is exactly what we saw in one corner of the field. And you can see, it's remarkable, that in, in, in a field which is almost dead and not interesting looking, these, these, this plant did well. And these seeds have to be saved and re-sown. This, this, this is one of the uses that evolutionary populations can, in a very simple way, in a very simple way that any farmer can manage in his own field or her field. This is a farmer, again, in Kermanshaw, who uh, the first time he came to visit one of these evolutionary population fields uh, said, can I have some, well, I don't know if he asked for permission, but anyway, he took some of the spikes and um, he's going to be planting them now uh, as a subpopulation. So these spikes that he selected himself will be another mixture. So they're, 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 the farmers are very much going on this logic of the mixtures. Um, and even uh, choosing, selecting the spikes from the population is a way of speeding up the evolutionary process, if you like. But they still stay with mixtures. And this is just to say that these, this particular evolutionary population of, of Vicarda is planted also in Algeria, in Syria, in Jordan, Eritrea, and in Iran. So what does this all mean now, all of this intense biodiversity which, which farmers are getting more and more excited about? What does it mean for, for policy? Um, I think we can start with a, special, with a report of the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food in 2009 on the issue of seed, seed policies and legislation and the right to food. And he says, the expansion of intellectual property rights can constitute an obstacle to the adoption of policies that encourage the maintenance of agrobiodiversity and reliance on farmers' varieties. And he underlines in particular that this is the case, especially because of concentration in, in, in the corporate seed sector. Um, these are very recent figures taken from ETC's website. Six multinational seed companies control 59.8% of commercial seeds and 76.1% of agrochemicals. The same six companies account for at least 76% of all private research and development in these two sectors. And of course, Monsanto is the largest one. And the concern is that a lot of legislation in a lot of our countries, seed legislation, is um, being designed for the benefit of these companies. And, and the way that this legislation is being designed prevents the kind of biodiversity that, that we've all just been looking at and which is so useful for farmers. And I'll show you exactly one example of how. So um, I, don't, I assume a lot of you know, or most of you have heard about UPOV, and the, so it's, it's, um, it's um, setting seed standards in, in many, many countries who are members of it. And the criteria of UPOV for uh, registering a new variety is that it has to be distinct, uniform, and stable. Well, this is an evolutionary, a field of, a, of, of an evolutionary population of wheat. And you can see, even the naked eye can see that this field is neither distinct, nor uniform, nor stable. And that's exactly the point. It's not supposed to be. And going back to the, um, to the Special Rapporteur's um, uh, report, he recommends that because of the importance of biodiversity for livelihoods and because it's important to have legislation which supports this use of, the, of biodiversity in farmers' hands and in their fields, it's very important either not to join UPOV at all or else to have also another system in your country which protects farmers' rights. And this is exactly what we have in Iran. So I'd like to take you to our legislation. We have a seed law which um, more or less goes towards um, UPOV standards. But then we have this seed and plant policy document. Um, and in this document, Article 9 says, farmers who produce farm-saved seed and plants have the right to store, use, exchange, and distribute their own plant materials. 
Paragraph 8, farmers using farm-saved seeds and plants are permi permitted to use protected varieties. There's another article, I'm very sorry that I don't have it here, um, but I've, an another article that says, all of what is in the seed law, so the distinct, uniform, and stable, doesn't apply to farm-saved seeds. So that we have a kind of two parallel systems, a system of protection for farmers so that they can continue doing the kind of work that participatory plant breeding and um, evolutionary plant breeding, um, the benefits that it brings them. And Mike, the question that I'd like to end with um, and leave you all with is who decides? Who decides on these policies? Who decides what laws should be enacted? Um, we can have a discussion about who decides now uh, currently, what's the situation? We can also decide about, would have a discussion about who should decide in principle, who should be at the table when we're deciding what kind of seed legislation and policy we need. So I just leave you with um, one of my favorite pictures. Um, this is Dr. Cecarelli with one of the farmers from Kermanshan. I, I wanted to close with this picture because I think it's very important to show that the rhetoric of participatory research, indigenous knowledge, and so on and so forth, it's nice that it's being reflected in policy spaces like this. It's better than nothing. But actually doing it in the field is very difficult because it requires researchers to be humble. Um, and that's something that researchers are not really taught to do. Um, and so... <laughs> And so this is, this is one of my favorite researchers, um, Dr. Cecarelli, because he's very humble, and you can see that in his interaction with the farmers. Thank you very much.